All right, so now I'm recording. So nobody say anything crazy. Um, oh, and uh, um, as a tradition in when I teach this class, uh, we do celebrate the end of the calculus sequence by having cake at the end of the semester. So, um, <laughs> yeah. There's more to it than that, but I'll, you'll, you'll see both of you who stay in the class to the end. Um, so if you drop, you're missing out. Okay. All right. Now, what I used to do was, um, let's see, what, what I used to do was uh, just give an overview of what the topics will be. And then I figured that I was actually even boring myself, let alone you guys, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but what I think will be more useful um, to, on this first day, because I'll actually get into the very first section uh, on Friday, um, but I think a better overview is I'm going to use techniques, the sort of approaches that we're going to see in this course, in Calculus 4, to show you how you can solve a problem that originates from Calculus 2. And from a Calculus 2 point of view, the problem seems completely impossible. And I'm going to show you that if you incorporate ideas from Calculus 3 and 4, the problem actually is not only possible, but fairly straightforward. Um, and I figure this will help because I'm going to be using concepts from uh, all three calculus courses that you've already seen, but some of you may have taken calculus three last semester, which is still several months ago, or some of you may have taken it a couple years ago. Um, I expect people to be rusty. Um, that's just the way it goes. But this will, but I'm hoping this will prove to be a useful refresher for you. And, give it, and if, if you find that some of the things I'm using from prior calculus classes you've completely forgotten, well, then that's a warning to you that you got some brushing up to do. Um, otherwise, um, you run the risk of falling behind. So I'll tell what I tell every one of my classes on the first day. No one is behind yet. So please try to keep it that way. <clears throat> OK. So, so here's the problem I think sh that we're going to look at. Um, this integral. Okay, um, integral from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. Now, this is not some frivolous problem. Um, this kind of function, uh, when you have uh, e uh, raised to a quadratic function uh, with a, a minus sign, <coughs> is an example of what is called a Gaussian function. Now, chances are, you've already heard the name Gauss. Gauss was one of the most... Uh, uh, prolific mathematicians that had many things named after him, even things he had nothing to do with, um, strangely. Um, and actually, he's also kind of a jerk. Um, uh, so, well, my own calculus professor said, well, Gauss rhymes with Laos. Um, but he knew his stuff. Uh, Gaussian function is very important in uh, differential equations, in uh, statistics. Um, uh, so it comes up a lot. And that's unfortunate because it can be kind of a difficult function to work with. Now, this integral um, from minus, in, because I have the endpoints, the, the definite integral going from minus infinity to infinity, does anyone remember from calculus two um, what what we called a kind of integral, kind of integral, where where we had the infinite limits here? Is it indefinite? Uh, definite, indefinite is when there's no limits. Improper. Improper. Yes. Um, and there's two kinds of improper integrals, like the other is where the integrand actually blows up uh, within, but this is the other kind where we have infinite limits. So, so that poses a challenge. But there's another problem. Um, because normally what you would do is you would just go ahead and compute the indefinite integral e to the minus x squared and then handle the, the, the limits. But here's the difficulty of this. Function e to minus x squared has no antiderivative, at least not in terms of elementary functions. It's actually been proven that no such antiderivative exists. So in, in calculus two, you use all kinds of techniques: integration by parts, partial fractions, um, substitutions, etc. Uh, you might think, oh, I'll do a substitution. 
on this like the u equal to minus x squared, it's not going to get you anywhere. So you can try to long past the cows coming home. You won't find an antiderivative. Um, so so what are we going to do? We have to use a very uh, different approach. And um, what's going to seem strange is I'm going to work with this integral in a way that appears to make the problem more difficult in order to actually make it much easier. Um, so, so here's what we'll do instead. Um, so first I'm going to write this as a square, this integral as a square root of itself squared. And then, since I really have two of these integrals on the inside, I can write them in slightly different ways. So first time, I'll write it as I have. Um, and then I'm going to multiply that by the same integral, except instead of using x on the inside, I can use a y. Because it's a, you're dealing with a definite integral. A definite integral, if it exists, is just a number. Uh, whatever letter I use on the inside for a variable of integration, it doesn't matter. It's, so we still have the same value, it's still the same integral. We're just being written in different ways. Now, you might think, well, why does that get us anything? Well, just you wait. Um, so now what I can do is, because this integral, um, actually, this integral is just a number, and you can multiply numbers in whatever order, you can always uh, move constant factors inside or outside integrals in any way you like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this integral, which is just a number, and move it inside the other. take um, this integrand, e to minus x squared, um, I can move it um, inside as well. Um, so um, because anything we have in this integrand, so really if you think of this, that I'm putting in brackets here as the whole integrand, everything's being multiplied. So I can just go ahead and rearrange things if I like. So now what I have is integrating twice on the inside with respect to y, on the outside with respect to x. Um, and now I have e to the minus x squared times e to the minus y squared. And all I've done here is use the same properties and integrals that you did all the time in Cal 2. If you have some constant factor, you can move it in or you can move it out. It doesn't matter. Um, now, it seems that no matter what class I'm teaching, even something like calculus 4, what people seem to have the most trouble with is the algebra. So let's put you guys to the test. Um, using laws of exponents, what can I do with that? How can I rewrite that? E to the negative x squared in, in the same exponent minus y squared. Yeah, I can combine. So when you have the same base, you can add the exponents. So I can rewrite this as, and I'm going to factor out the minus. So this is e to the minus and then the quantity x squared plus y squared. Okay. All right. Um, now, um, well, first, any questions about how any of that went? All right, so these are just properties of integrals, the same one dimensional integrals you dealt with in Cal 2. Um, now, the way this is often written, because now we have what is called a double integral um, over a two-dimensional space instead of a single interval like it dealt with in Cal 2. And the way that is often written, 
please don't fall. Um, is this way. Or actually, it's the integral over, because x and y are both going to minus, from minus infinity to infinity. So I'm integrating over all of R2. I have two integral signs here because I'm integrating over a two-dimensional entity, the, the entire xy plane. And my integrand is this exponential. And then I use dA, which is a shorthand for dx dy. dx you can think of as an element of length. It's an infinite, if, infinitesimally small interval. Whereas dA, you can think of it as being an infinitesimally small rectangle uh, with side lengths dx and dy. Uh, when we get to triple integrals of three dimensions, you'll have you'll see notation dv, so it's an infinitesimally small box uh, with dimensions dx, dy, and dz. So, oh, I forgot the one half here. I'm taking square root of all that. So if we can go ahead and find a way to evaluate this, and it seems strange that why should this be any easier than what I started with? But again, bear with me. Okay. So what, what we're going to do is use something that you should have seen in Cal 3. Polar coordinates. Now, they don't remember what polar coordinates are. How can I express x and y in terms of polar coordinates, which are r and theta? That ring a bell. Don't be shy. Give it a shot. Somebody. Anybody. Go ahead. There's a bell that's the... What? It's not a room of bell. I know it's from trig. R time. Oh, x equals r, y equals theta. No. Right. I guess they don't call it correspond to one to one. Because uh, R is the angle, uh, R is the radial distance, and theta is the angle. R cosine theta, and what is Y? Theta sine. R sine theta. Yeah, so if you have any points, x, y, <coughs> this is why I'm doing this, you can see, here's what you've forgotten, because these things are going to come up now and then. You have some time. Um, so here's your distance from the origin, r, um, and then here's our, your rectangular distances, x and y. This is the angle theta. And from right triangle trigonometry, remember that? You have uh, x is your adjacent side. Um, so you have cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Cosine theta is x over r. And just rearranging it, x is r cosine theta. And then similar for y. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to, because in Cal 2, you did substitutions to make a change of variable within an integral of one dimension. What we'll learn in this course is the same idea in higher dimensions. So it's still like substitution in a way, but instead of substituting only one variable, you know, x becomes u, um, then we're, we're taking you know, x, y, changing to r and theta, or other uh, three-dimensional changes that we'll see, uh, like cylindrical or, or, or spherical. Um, so from the Pythagorean theorem, you can see in the picture, you have x squared plus y squared is r squared. Uh, so here, you see how to convert from r and theta to x and y. But here's how you can convert uh, uh, the other way. And the reason why this is nice is uh, this integrand now is just e to the minus r squared. Now you might think, OK, that still doesn't get us anywhere. Because we had e to the minus x squared to start with. Now we have e to the minus r squared. Again, bear with me. This will all be justified in the end. I still have 25 minutes. OK. So um, what he did in Cal 2 is he made the substitution. u is equal to some function g of x, or u substitution. And then du would be g prime of x dx. And you'd hopefully choose the right substitution so that the new integral would be easier than the old. 
Our goal here is exactly the same, except now it happens in higher dimension. So, um, so if your element of area in two dimensions in rectangular coordinates is something relatively simple to work with, dx, dy. Um, but we want to evaluate this integral in polar coordinates. So we want to know what is, so what is an element of area expressed in polar coordinates? If we can figure that out, then we can see what integral we're going to deal with in polar coordinates, and hopefully that would be easier than the original. Okay, so if we think about how um, a mapping from polar space, so we have our variables r and theta. And suppose we have what is called a polar rectangle. So if you're looking, if you're living in r theta space, a polar rectangle can simply be called the, a rectangle. Um, so we have um, some interval between r1 and r2 in r, and then some interval theta1 and to theta2 in theta. But we're living in the xy world. How does this translate into x and y? So, I guess to see if any of this is visible. Okay. All right, that'll work. Um, so what happens is we're using our mapping from polar to rectangular or Cartesian coordinates. X is r cosine theta. Y is r sine theta. And if you take these points and map them over here, a polar rectangle is actually like, you can think of it as being like a piece of a, a segment of a pie slice. Um, because, um, so this is the line theta equals theta 1. This is theta equals theta 2. This is the circle, r equals r1. This is the circle, r equals r2. So what is a rectangle? A rectangle of polar coordinates is this like wedge in um, in the x y plane. So um, so the area of this is our d a, if you will, for our integral. So we need to figure out what is the area of that. Now um, there's actually a couple of different ways we could do this, but I'm going to do this in a way that brings back more Cal 3 knowledge, uh, because I want to make sure you guys are somewhat up to speed on that going into Cal 4. Um, because think of these changes in r and theta as being really small. So that rectangle is really small. This wedge is really small. In that case, even though this is um, a portion of a uh, circle, you can basically approximate this. You can think of it as being like a parallelogram. So if I zoom in on this, it's not exactly a parallelogram, but it's pretty close. Um, now, we want the area of this. So if the edges, uh, if two adjacent sides of this parallelogram are defined by vectors u and v, then in Cal 3, you learned a formula for the area of a parallelogram. Am I being taught this thing to think that someone might remember that? You take the cross product of u and v. Hopefully that rings a bell. You may not remember how to do it, but you're gonna. And then you take the magnitude of that vector. Um, and magnitude of the vector, you, just, you just square all the components add them up and take the square root. Um, OK, and that's actually what we're going to do in this case. So if we can define the edges of this parallelogram, then we can use this formula and get the area. And whatever we get for dA, that is worked into our integral in order to evaluate it. All right, so, uh, so thinking of this as a parallelogram, we'll figure out what these vectors u and v are. So far, the taping is working OK. All right. 
So I'm going to reproduce this picture here. Our approximate parallelogram. Okay. I guess it's not very parallelogram -y, is it? But okay. So I want this vector u, this vector v. Now this point right here, you can think of it as having it has x y coordinates and So this lower left corner right here, I'm taking the points r1 and theta1, and I'm mapping them to x, y values. Whereas here, let's see, um, Here it's also R1 because it's on the inner circle, but I'm using theta 2. Okay, and this point up here, because this is R1, this is R2, this is theta 1, theta 2. Um, and actually, I think I need to fix that. Yeah, this should be theta 1 and theta 2 to agree with what's in my house. Um, <coughs> I'm just going to take the absolute value at the end anyway. So we have r2 theta 1, and then y of r2 theta 1. OK. So I'm taking corners of my polar rectangle and mapping them to x, y. I don't need this point. These three will do it. So now I can just subtract coordinates, x and y coordinates, to get my vectors u and v. So my vector u is going to be, I subtract these x values, x of r2 theta 1 minus x of r1 theta 1. And in the y coordinate, same thing. OK. And then the vector v, also, I can subtract x and y coordinates here. Okay. So I have x of r1 theta 2 minus x of r1 theta 1. So the r value, here the r value is, cha is not changing, the theta value is. Here it's the opposite. The r value is changing, the theta value is not. Um, because these are adjacent sides of my parallelogram. All right, so I have r1 theta 2 minus y of r1 theta 1. OK. Now, I'd like to be able to simplify these to help me compute the area. And I'm going to use something that's all the way from back in Cal 1. So I'm not even going to bother asking if you guys remember it, because you're not remembering any Cal 3 either. And it's OK. I try to make these, my classes self-contained. Um, if, if you're not following this, it's not something to stress about. This is just giving you ideas to where you're at so, and, and how to build on that from there, so that when you get to the homeworks, you can do them. Um, so, I'm going to use from count one, and hopefully at least the term rings a bell, if not the actual mathematical statement. Mean value theorem. Now, in count one, you saw the intermediate value theorem and the mean value theorem. They're completely different things. Mean value theorem says that f of b minus f of a over b minus a is equal to f prime of c, where c is between a and b. Hopefully that rings a bell. And what they probably gave you in Cal 1 were really stupid problems, where you give you f, a, and b, and they ask you to find the value of c that makes this work. Forgetting that in the real world, in any real application, no one ever cares what c is. Um, there's generally no way of knowing it. The uh, point is, it exists. And the, so I prefer to write the formula this way. f of b minus f of a is f prime of c b minus a. That's the useful form of the theorem because it tells you that if you have a difference of function values, you can write it in terms of a difference between the x values. So change in y is equal to change in x times the derivative. 
Um, so I can rewrite this as here r is changing, theta is not. So I can say dx dr um, at some unknown point, which I'll call r star. I don't know what it is, and I actually don't care what it is, um, times the change in r. So this dimension of my parallelogram I'll call dr. This dimension of my parallelogram I'll call d theta, just for sh shorthand. So change in x is equal to change in x divided by change in r times a change in r. Um, and then, similar over here, I have a change in y values. That is equal to derivative of y with respect to r at some unknown um, r value times a change in r. Now, this notation looks something like what you've seen before, but it's slightly different. Because in 1D, you have dy dx, derivative of y with respect to x. That's familiar to you. Or it better be, or what are you doing here? Um, in higher dimensions, your function depends on several variables. This is multivariable calculus. So we write it slightly differently. The partial derivative of function f with respect to x or with respect to y. So like if f depends on both x and y, here's a rate of change with respect to one of these variables. Here's a rate of change with respect to the other. The way you compute these is very similar to what you did in Cal 1. You'll see when we get to there next week, there won't be much to it. Um, but the, I think the main thing I need to tell you now is note a slight difference in notation. Here we just use plain old D. Here we use this little squiggly character um, to denote partial derivative instead of the entire derivative. And the most important thing I can tell you now, because this is going to come up otherwise, is this symbol here is not a 2. And I tell people that even towards the end of the semester, people are still thinking it's a dang 2. Hmm. It's not a 2. So just to, and see how I write a 2 here? That's a 2. It's not a very good two. All right, buddy, see the difference? OK. So remember, nothing else from today. Please remember it back. OK. So, um, so here we have a change of x and y with respect to r. Here, similar idea, only theta is changing, r is not. So this would be change of x with respect to theta at r1 and some unknown theta value times a change in theta. And the only thing we know about this unknown theta value is it's between theta 1 and theta 2. But theta 1 and theta 2 is a very small difference anyway. So OK. So in between, that derivative, none of these derivatives are really changing very much because we're dealing with such a small interval. So now I have my vectors u and v. So to get the area of a parallelogram, I can just take the cross product of these two. But there's one problem. When you learn cross product in Cal 3, okay, 10 minutes. All right, we'll see. When you um, did cross product in Cal 3, those are vectors in three dimensions. These are vectors in only two dimensions. But that's OK. We're working in the xy plane. We'll just add on a z coordinate of uh, 0. And that will actually make the cross product itself um, very simple to compute. Thank you for being so accommodating. <laughs> All right. So the cross product of u and v, so that would be, uh, here's some shorthand because I'm running out of time. Partial derivative of x with respect to r is often written this way, x with a r subscript. The subscript says what variable we're taking a derivative with respect to. In count 1 and 2 and 3, you only dealt with one independent variable. Uh, so you used a prime. Uh, I have x prime here. So that's one thing about count 4. Prime no longer has any meaning. It's ambiguous, so don't use it. Um, so, so what we have here is dx dr dr dy dr dr 
and then an extra z coordinate of zero, cross product with dx d theta d theta d y d theta d theta and zero. And using a formula for cross product, I'll just jump to the punchline here. Um, and if you don't know cross product, I'd recommend reviewing it. Um, is just a vector 0, 0, so that's nice. And then we have dx dr, um, dy d theta minus d y dr dx d theta. And then these numbers dr and d theta can just be factored out of these vectors. Um, so now, if I want to take the magnitude of this, so my area dA is the magnitude of this vector, all that is is the absolute value of this component. <coughs> now, I have formulas for x and y in terms of r and theta. I wrote them down earlier. r cosine theta, r sine theta. So now if I take a derivative of these with respect to r and theta, well, dx dr is going to be cosine theta. dy d theta is going to be r cosine theta. dy dr is sine theta. And then dx d theta is going to be r times minus sine theta. Um, so remember your derivatives of sine and cosine. Because um, all I did was, for instance, to take derivative of x with respect to r, I think of theta as a constant. And then I just take derivative with respect to r, which is 1. And then I still have this cosine theta sitting there as a constant. And we'll get into more of that next week. But that's the general idea. Um, so now we simplify this, we get r cosine squared plus r sine squared. But cosine squared plus sine squared equals? The only trigonometry that anybody ever remembers. Yes. <laughs> One. So that simplifies. And all that's left is r. Uh, and then I have dr d theta. So in my integral that I had before, the integral of e to the minus x squared plus y squared dA, I can write that in polar coordinates. So the exponential itself becomes e to the minus r squared. We saw that already. And then dA becomes r dr d theta. And when you're integrating over the entire xy plane, r is going from 0 to infinity. Theta is going all the way around, all angles, 0 to 2 pi. So that covers the entire two-dimensional space. So the first integral of just e to the minus x squared dx, that was impossible. What makes this one possible? How can this one be done? What does that factor of r do? How would you tackle that integral? Well, what approach would you use in Cal 2? It is doable in Cal 2 land. What did you learn in Cal 2? What technique? Substitution. Yes, what's substitution? U equal to better take a stab and be wrong. Yes. That's one point I want to make is about when it comes to when I pose questions to the class. And a lot of people don't like to answer because they think it might be wrong. I'd rather have someone give wrong answers a thousand times than maybe have a right answer in hand and keep silent. So give it a shot. I'm not going to think less of you if you get it wrong because I'm going to respect you more for trying. So yes, u is r squared. So now du is 2r dr. And voila, we have a factor of r just sitting there. So now um, we can rewrite this integral as <coughs> 1 half integral from 0 to 2 pi of d theta. Again, you can rearrange. So we're integrating 1 with respect to theta, and then integrating 
uh, e to the minus u du. So that is an integral, both of these integrals can be evaluated very easily using what you learn in Cal 2. So this integral is 2 pi, and then the 2's will cancel out. And then this integral just turns out to be 1. Because what you can do is you can um, uh, take the indefinite integral and then take the upper the limit as the upper limit tends to infinity. And uh, now I have notes for everything today posted on the site. I suggest you read through them later. So I worked out the details of this integral here um, to show you that it's 1. So the point is we get pi um, for this integral, which is called a double integral. But if we need, we need to return to what was the original problem. Which now we can finally wrap up that in the last three minutes. That the integral we started with, minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus x squared dx, which was found to be the square root of the integral, the double integral over all of two-dimensional space of e to the minus x squared plus y squared dA, after all that, turned out to be square root of pi. So that's the final answer. Um, so the reason why I like to do a problem like this is to show you that just because a problem seems impossible does not mean that it actually is. A difficult math problem is actually a, an easier math problem that's being looked at the wrong way. If you find the right perspective, then you can find a way to do it. And this is something that is, can only be seen in a class such as this one. It's something I've uh, proven over and over again uh, in, in my research, always finding a way to, uh, to, to, to make improvements of what was done before. Even when at first glance, it seems like there's absolutely no way. It's all a matter of perspective. Um, and that's, that's one of the things I love about math, is that there's so many different ways to turn around a problem, look at it, and finding a right choice is not easy. It takes experience, it takes practice, it takes a lot of persistence, um, and also really a lot of faith in yourself that you can uh, find the right way. This, this is something that you would see in a smaller scale with regard to your homework problems, but also is true on a larger scale with much more difficult endeavors. Um, so this is just an example I can show you in 50 minutes. Um, so you can see that a lot of things I use from you know, Cal 1, 2, and 3, um, if it was all over your head, then maybe you should brush up on Cal 1, 2, and 3 because it's going to make things, because Cal 3 is a prerequisite for this course for a reason. If you come in not remembering any of your prerequisite, of course you're going to have trouble. So um, I, you have some time before first assignments are due, so uh, use that time to make sure that you're really ready. Um, and I'm always here to help, uh, whether it's by coming to my office or, or, or emailing me or whatever. Um, because if I don't hear any questions, then uh, what can I assume are revenge you're getting it? And if you're not, that's something that you need to correct. So make sure you take advantage of that. So go to the site, see what's there, take advantage of it too. Take advantage of what, everything that I'm offering, and then you'll have a lot easier time in this class. And yes, I know you're wanting to leave, and okay, finally, yes, it's 12.50. But that's another thing. Don't do that packing up three minutes before, because that's annoying. So um, yes, go ahead, pack up and go. I'll see you Friday.